on the screen on this day made a very important statement. And the statement is, and I'm just going to uh, focus in on the last part of it, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. I mean, that is a very powerful statement as it relates to a passage that we're going to be going to in the body of this sermon. This is, this is the sermon that I do not need any notes. I'll give this sermon any time, any day, anywhere to anyone that will listen because I believe it is the most important message that can ever be given, given as it relates to the destiny and fate of mankind, both the wicked and those that look to God. I know that is, that's a big statement, but what I'm going to share with you today, I, I have a couple of slides that I want to show you, and then and we'll just, it'll just be me and the Bible and you, and we're going to have a conversation. Because this is a topic that is very near and dear to me, as it is, I am sure, to you. I want to go to the conclusion of the matter as it is articulated. This is actually something that Paul wrote, but it is actually a quote from Isaiah. Then it shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O hell, where is your victory? I mean, when, when that comes to pass, I mean, we have experienced death. I mean, death has been close almost around me this week with friends and people that um, we are involved with uh, tragically dying. So death is something that has a sting. It is something that we resist intuitively. Um, but a time is coming in which that will be vanquished. So here is a question. This is, this is a quote, a, a video somebody just sent to me yesterday, and I thought this fit very well into the topic. And this is a video that was posted about a month ago. So it happened sometime in September. A 75-year-old Catholic asked this question. He, he stood up in a uh, congregational presentation and said, my question that I'm going to ask has been bothering me for many, many years of my adult life. Do billions of non-Christian denominations, the Jewish, the Buddhists, the Confucius, the Mormons, I, I thought it was interesting that he, he lumped the Mormons into this category, and so forth, that truly believe in their faith. They, they truly believe, but not on the one name that the apostles said, the only name, rather, that the apostles said uh, by which one must be saved, that lived a very good life according to their faith. So here was the question that was put forward to a name you may recognize, John MacArthur. MacArthur. Is their salvation a heaven for them, or are they all condemned to hell? It's a fair question. It's a difficult question, but it's a fair question. John MacArthur um, answered it succinctly. The answer is that, the answer to that question from the Word of God is that they will all perish in hell. That, that was his answer. That's what he believes. It also, I mean, it, it, you know, we'll look at this. This idea and this belief shapes your view of God. The question is, is that answer biblically accurate? And here's really where, what, what, what gets to the heart of it. Can a just God condemn to hell people who have never heard the one name by which one must be saved, namely Jesus Christ. I mean, if, if you look in Acts chapter 4, where this quote is taken from, I mean, the, the apostles were very dogmatic about the fact that there is only one path to salvation, namely Jesus Christ. So then, 
according to John MacArthur, everybody else, even if they didn't know, um, is condemned to hell. So I, I'm, I'm going to raise a couple of questions here. So what is the reward of the saved? I mean, is it, as it is widely believed, is it a disembodied afterlife in nirvana or a heaven of sorts? I mean, is that accurate? Or is it a glorified resurrection from the dead into the image of the heavenly man or in the image of the heavenly man? I mean, these are two contrasting positions. The former is widely believed. It's just kind of the default position. The latter, I believe, and we will demonstrate from Scripture, is true. What about the punishment of the wicked? Is it, as is generally believed, eternal life in an inferno? You know, actually, that notion, that idea was popularized by a poem in the Middle Ages called Dante's Inferno. Or, or will they perish like stubble in a grass fire on a hot summer day? I mean, again, these are two very, very different positions. These are critical questions that shape our image of the eternal God. I'd like to read a couple scriptures with you. John chapter 3, verse 16. We've all heard of that, right? John chapter 3, verse 16 is without question the most common scripture or a central scripture, as it should be. Because it makes, a, it makes a very powerful statement about the nature of God. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it's interesting to note, and this is what most people read right over, it is only through the gift of God and the love of God, through salvation in Christ, that we avoid a destiny in which we perish and receive the gift of God, which is life eternal. Most people read right over top of that. You know what a lot of people also read, overlook? Back up, the, back up in the Bible, three verses to verse 13. This is a statement that Jesus made to Nicodemus. It is the conversation um, that they have by night. In verse 13 it says, No one has ascended to heaven. Really? I mean, what about Abraham? What about Isaac? What about Jacob? What about David? What about all of those that had gone before? You know, what about Abraham, the, you know, Abraham's bosom? What, what does that all mean? If, in fact, what Jesus said here is true, that no one had ascended to heaven, save, it says here, <clears throat> he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. So, you know, we're talking about the unseen realm, and here we have some very important points. Number one, if you don't get eternal life as a gift from God, you perish. And according to Jesus Christ, no one's gone to heaven, at least at the point that he was talking about. So those are, those are um, uh, statements that Jesus made, it's not my words, that stand in stark contrast to popular belief. Malachi. Malachi chapter 4. As the Old Testament concludes, talks about destiny. There is a day, verse 1, coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. That, that is consistent with what Jesus said that God so loved the world that he did not want anybody to be extinguished, to be taken, have life extinguished from them, 
and to the point where they perish. Continuing, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow like, grow fat like stall-fed calves. I mean, kind of like the Feast of Tabernacles, you know. <laughs> I think I've put on a pound or two, and if you didn't, you probably should have, right? <clears throat> and Gordon was all that pie and ice cream. It, it, I mean, he was going to have a flat tire on the way home. <laughs> now he's complaining again, you know. <laughs> that, that proves he's German. <laughs> yeah, you descended pretty well. Okay, I'm just trying to make him feel loved, right? He was complaining to me yesterday. Notice in verse 3, You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Very different statement from popular belief. The truth is true, but it's never really been popular. But it works. And it's, co it's coherent, and it's rational, and most importantly, it is sourced from God. So, the question about destiny of those who knew or know, of those who have heard the name of Christ, and the fate of those who didn't. That's what the topic of this day is all about. And believe me, I, I've looked. This day and the meaning of this day is the only rational, cohesive answer that I have found that allows for a God who is just and is perfect in mercy. So, I've got a little infographic here to help us out. And what I'd like to do with you is, okay, we're, we're going to move along pretty rapidly. And we're going to go through a number of scriptures. And I look at this, you know, I've, I've had some experience with law and court of law over the last couple of years. This is something that I think you could prove in court. It's not something, it's, it's not something that's just imagined. This is something that I ideally want all of you to go home and say, now I know. I know, I know how I could prove this from Scripture. Because at the end of the day, my opinion doesn't matter. Mr. Weber's opinion doesn't matter. All of us that spoke here do so imperfectly, hopefully under the inspiration of God in a way that is inspiring. But it doesn't matter what I say. What matters is what all scriptures say. So write this down. A definitive statement of Scripture cannot be superseded by what you might infer from a Scripture. What that means is simply this. When, when you read in Malachi that the wicked shall perish and they will be like ashes under the soles of your feet... That's a definitive, explicit statement that cannot be superseded by other scriptures that may infer something different. So, let's walk through this. And I'd like to begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because there's a first resurrection and then there's a second resurrection and I believe a third resurrection. And it all comes down to a resurrection from the dead 
that was resurrections from the dead that were made possible by the very first resurrection to a glorified life that Jesus Christ experienced and demonstrated to his apostles. And it wasn't until that event that his message took on power and traction that arguably changed the Western world. The Western world is very different because of the influence of a three and a half year ministry of a man, if we dare say that, in an outback protectorate of the Roman Empire. Three and a half years. That's all he had. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to begin reading in verse 1 because this reads like a legal brief. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. He died according to the prophecy of Scripture. Paul wrote to Timothy, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's productive for doctrine, for reproof and correction. Notice how he defines this. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to scriptures. Not, not a day and a half later. Jesus said that the only sign that he's going to give the legalistic Pharisees of his Messiahship was the fact that he would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth because they wanted to see a sign. You see why this reads like a legal brief? Okay. Three days, three nights. And they had to eat those words. They had to, they had to, um, to use a popular... They had to censure. They had to cancel what haven't, uh, actually occurred. Because they could not... You know, the, the seal that was put on there from Pontius Pilate did not keep... Was not able to restrain him. You know, we saw earlier um, cemeteries, the Webbers, and my wife and I did, did a tour of cemeteries. We visited my dad's grave and grandparents' graves, and you've, you've got all these cemeteries, and, you know, one day those graves will open. It's interesting, I think in this area, if not all the cemeteries, at least most of them, um, people will, the, the headstones face easterly. You know, it's interesting what uh, remnants of, so, so you, you, you lay somebody to rest, their feet are facing east, so that when they rise up, they will be fe facing their Lord, who we know from prophecy will come from the east. It was three days and three nights. So what does Satan do? You have a good Friday Easter tradition, right? And people believe the lie, unfortunately. Verse 5, And that he was seen by Cephas, Peter, then by the twelve, and in verse 6 is where it gets really compelling. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to present, but some have fallen asleep. The, the common explanation on uh, what happened, you know, if you deny the resurrection of Christ, is that, you know, obviously the, the, the apostles were having post-traumatic stress syndrome, and they hallucinated. But that explanation won't hold up in court. 
You know, if I had the opportunity to cross-examine, I would bring psychologists and professors to bear to testify that there has never been one case of hallucination by two people hallucinating at the same time. Here you have 500. You know why this is also important? This was written roughly 20 years after it occurred. And as Paul here writes, a great number of the individuals, these 500, were still alive when he wrote this to the Corinthian church. 500 witnesses that encountered the risen Christ at the same time? You can win that in court. You see... We are not following, as Peter said, cunningly devised fables. We're following the word of God and the living Jesus Christ. And he says here that if Christ is not written, uh, sorry, if Christ is not risen, we of all people are most miserable. I mean, it comes, uh, it comes down to his resurrection, to glory. If that did not occur, we're all wasting our time. And he says right here in chapter 15 that we would be, of all people, most miserable. But we're not. It, it, this, this whole first section of chapter 15, I like the, the latter part, the image of the heavenly man and the, the first Adam and the second Adam and the twinkling of an eye I and mean, all of that will... Read that quickly. But you know that. You've heard it countless times. I remember hearing it in, in, in Amish church as a youth. Okay, you hear that. But what is really important in this chapter from a faith perspective is the fact that the facts are facts that you could demonstrate, and I'm very confident you could win in court even back in, in Roman times. I mean, even Festus said that he almost was persu persuaded to believe so compelling was the evidence. So there is Christ's resurrection. It's right here in, um, <clears throat> in verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruit. That has happened. Afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. You see, on this little infographic that I have up on the screen, you have the, the present wicked, evil world that is counter, and as Marcus mentioned, um, and I don't know if Marcus, uh, you may not know this, um, we have over 30 people in the room that have kept the feast for more than 50 consecutive years. And surely, if you would raise your hand, uh, she has kept it for 70. I mean, that, I, I mean that, that's remarkable. There are a lot of stories in this room. And, that, and as you rightly mentioned, a price was paid, but I think most of us would say it was a blessing, not a price. So if you look at this infographic, you have Jesus Christ raised, and then there is this first resurrection. That Hebrews chapter 11, if you read, remember Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter. Well, let's go there for a minute, because I think it's important it's important to read it from the Word of God instead of me just paraphrasing. Hebrews chapter 11 is the face chapter because it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that doesn't, you know, th th this is, again, not cunningly devised fables. But let's go over just the page in verse 30, notice, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they encircled for seven days. This, this, this occurred 
during the days of unleavened bread. They, they conquered a city by marching around it. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she received the spies with peace. <clears throat> and what more should I say, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword out of weakness, were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the, the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might all go to heaven. Doesn't say that, does it? That they may obtain a better resurrection. The path to life comes only through a resurrection and an instantaneous change if you are alive and remain when Jesus returns. It's that simple. If we read our Bible for what it says. That they may obtain a better resurrection. I mean, it's better for a reason. Let's now go to Revelation chapter 20. Verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them. The judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received on their foreheads or on their, in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Again, just to kind of give this context, there's a thousand years of a kingdom yet to come. And it talks about the fact that those who had experienced these things, that had paid a price, would live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. That hasn't happened. You know, there are, you know, there's the pre-millennials, the amillennials, you have all, all kinds of different beliefs about this. But if Christ is ruling on the earth right now, <laughs> um, he's a pretty poor ruler, right? Notice verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So we, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I mean, it is with the, the argument of Paul. He said, each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Christ the first fruit. Afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming. So you have categories of people here. You have Christ. You have those who are Christ's with a timing element at his coming who are raised in what John received from the risen Christ in a resurrection that's called the first resurrection. And then you have another category of people. It's a lot of people the rest of the dead, who had ever lived, did not live again for a thousand years. And there are those who live into the millennial reign of Christ. There are those who are changed at his coming that will rule with him. And then there's a whole category of people that go back to the question of the individual in the audience and said, you know, this has been troubling me for a long time. My entire life, I'm 75 years old. I haven't figured this out. And it bothers me that a God who gave his only son would then, on the other hand, you know, condemn to hell all of those who've never heard about his son. You can't make, you cannot make a rational argument for a just God 
if you take that position. And, you know, uh, John MacArthur does a lot of good things. I mean, I, I, he, he, he was one of the ministers who stood during COVID and others. I applaud him for that. But he's also, I think, rightly called a hardliner. Okay? He, he, we are what we believe. We are what we believe. And his, his view of God and what God does with those who haven't heard shapes him as a person. We heard what I believe was a astonishing sermon about the mercy of God. And, um, you know, something that I've kind of come to over the last a number of years is that, you know, if you look at what God has done, you know, remember the names I read? Gideon, Samson, David. Oh, they're heroic in the Bible. You know what they also were? Very, very flawed individuals. God's bar for mercy for somebody who has a repentant attitude and heart is pretty low. It's pretty low. So, this conception that God would condemn to an condemn to an ever-burning hell, people who never, you know, they were, they were in Africa. I mean, the indigenous people here, you know, you know, you can make a long list of the rest of the dead. And it's a, it's a real problem. It's a really big problem because recent studies have shown that evangelical Christian youth that go on to woke colleges which I don't recommend, to a large extent lose what they have been taught, and the primary reason given is that they can't conceive a God who would condemn people to hell who never even heard. You know, you, we, can, we can have a debate about what constitutes hearing, okay? That, 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 that's out there, you know, that's something we can debate on. But let's, let's stay on solid ground here. There are billions of people that never heard about Jesus Christ. What about them? Well, it says here that they're going to stay dead until the thousand years are finished. Verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection... Over such the second death has no power. That's why it's better. Okay? That's why it's called a better resurrection. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And then in, in the next couple of verses, you know, after the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. And I say this metaphorically, the world goes to hell in a handbasket, really quickly. And then you come to two verses that provide a framework and a context in which other prophecies provide detail. But let's look at verse 12 and verse 13. It says in, sorry, verse 11 and 12 and then verse 13. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. So obviously there is some level of metaphoric language here. But, you know, this great white throne, it's interesting that it's a white throne to me. It's not a black throne. It's not a, a, a throne of condemnation. I'll get to that. But my, con my conception of that, historically, and I think it's fair to say that of many people is, you know, I, 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 I remember, I mean, as a kid, I had a creative mind, you know. 
And I, I, I remember thinking, you know, this, this throne with an angry God on it, and, and you, have this, you, have a line of, you have a line of people, you know, filing by. Thoom, thoom, you know, thoom. One place was hot, and then there was others that got elevated. I mean, I just, you know, that's what a creative little John Miller mind does when you're, you know, six or seven years old. Is that what it's saying here? I think we have to look at the next verse and, and, and read what it says. And it says, verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Okay. Well, if, let's look at what it says. It says, the dead, small and great, and this is the precision of language. These were great people and insignificant people. These are little people and tall people. I mean, it, it's both. The language includes both. It's everybody that are part of the rest of the dead that did not live again until the thousand years were finished. It's interesting, these books that were opened. You know, when, when, you, when you look at the Greek word, it's a word called, in Greek, biblion. The books that will be, the book that is opened here are the books that we have right here right now. Those books are going to be open to these people who've never heard the name of Christ. By the risen Christ. That's what it says. I'm not making this up. The books of the Bible will be open to them. And then the book of life is open to them. And then, and only then, they are judged according to what is written in the books. You see, when God said that he sent his only son, and that he did so because he so loved the world, and in the next verse, we often don't read verse 17, he says he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, you see, all of those statements of love and sacrifice and all that he did to make possible eternal life to mortal man stands in stark contrast with the notion that he would then just throw everybody who never who or knew, knew or heard of God into a burning cauldron. It makes no rational sense. Truth makes sense. Truth is rational. God is a rational God. <clears throat> Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 37. Oops. Don't put your Bible onto the keyboard because I have a touch screen. Bill, did you hear that? I have a touch screen. S technically savvy people have touch screens. <clears throat> you need, you need, we need to work on this, Bill. Next year you come with a touch screen. It'll be a touching experience. <laughs> okay. Ezekiel chapter 37. This is a marvelous prophecy. And it, I hope to show you, parallels, adds detail to what we just read in Revelation chapter 20. And I believe that as sure as I'm sitting here. And, 
And I, I would invite anybody, let's take it to court. I, I like a good debate. We can do it at the, at the campfire tonight after we've, after we've loaded up all the tables, right? <laughs> because this is an important question. It is, a, it is given as the primary reason for thousands of young people leaving, deserting their belief in God. Notice in chapter 37, this is the Valley of the Dry Bones, and it's, this is not a metaphor. The reason I know that is because um, of the detail that is given here. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out into the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Now we have a very talented individual in our midst that did a painting about this great day. You know, he, uh, his name is David T. David, where are you at today? There he, there he is. You, you, you can, I mean, art, is, one of the nice things about art is, you know, there's interpretation, okay? But the beauty about this is we have the artist among us so he can share with you um, what he was thinking. You have all these people. You have soldiers marching. You have people in middle-aged middle costumes. You've got, you've got skeletons. But let's, let's read this. Then verse 2, And he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, they were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. <clears throat> that was a, I think that was a safe answer. <laughs> you know, you got a bunch, you ever seen skeletons? And the skeletal remains. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. You see, if this were a metaphor, all this language would not be necessary. You know, you, you have skeletons. All you would have to say is, well, I mean, there's the valley of dry bones, and the Lord spake, and they all stood up and came back to life. I believe, I, I, uh, this is my belief, I believe God inspired this this way because it is extremely difficult to spiritualize away what Ezekiel wrote here. Bones, sinews, muscles, flesh. And notice, then you shall know that God is going to punish you. I'm just checking to see if you're reading, okay? Then you shall know that I am the Lord. <laughs> I'm going to say, no kidding, you know? You have people who died and all of a sudden you, you come back to life and there he is. It's going to make a pretty good first impression, I would think. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and suddenly a rattling, and bone came together, bone to bone. Let me see if this slide thing works. Look at that. <laughs> there you have half skeletons and halfway put together, flesh coming. You see that guy on the, on the right with flesh coming to his bones, and he's got a little skeleton. I mean, th this is a great depiction of what is described here. I, this, this one, how many mothers do you know that could be in this picture? How many of you have had a family member die tragically? Look, look at the hands. How many of you know of families that have had miscarriages? Look at the hands. 
You see, tragedy is never far from the door. And miscarriage, unfortunately, is one of those hidden things that usually doesn't get properly mourned for. It's a loss of a real human life that obviously needs healing. And I think the artist kind of, look at that. Look at that. That's what this day is about. So what you have here is a skeleton with a fetus in, in there and another skeleton. You know, you can just... I mean, this is going to be an unimaginable day in its scope and impact. <clears throat> Indeed, verse 8, as I looked, sinews and flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Then they said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. Thousands upon thousands upon millions of people fit the category of the rest of the dead. I mean, God also has, I mean, it's just, God has a rational plan. You have those who are Christ that is coming. And how broad that net is cast is up to God. But it will be a small number in comparison to, see the sun is shining, I said, it's a walnut creek where the sun always shines. <laughs> Look at the light. That was a digression in case you didn't notice. <clears throat> Having a cadre, if I may use that word, of followers of Christ that reign with him for a thousand years is a rational plan and preparation to then deal with, help, serve, lift up, teach, open the books. I mean, this is, this is a massive operation that is being done incrementally. It's a plan that is rational, is merciful, and most of all, envisions a God that is perfect in mercy and just. Because after all this, there are those who will rebel or have rebelled. And God in his justice can put them away. And nobody can fault that. I would not give my son... I would not, get, I've lost a son. I know what that feels like. I would not give my son, my only other son, for my competition. And I, I wouldn't do that. And I dare say, neither would you, but God did. That's a very different conception of God the Father than is popularly believed, but I believe it is accurate, consistent, and true. He did what none of us would do. For people who did not deserve it, So I have every confidence that he will be just. <clears throat> Verse 11, And he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. 
They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy to them, thus says the Lord, Behold, O my people, I will cause your graves, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. These are very literal words for a specific group of people. The murmuring, cantankerous, idolatrous, Sabbath-breaking Israelites. That's what it says here. It says he hasn't given up on him. Verse 13, Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Apparently they didn't know that he was the Lord in the wilderness. They refused. They refused to believe in, in him in many cases. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. Then verse 14, are you ready? I will put my spirit in you. Wow. I'll put my spirit in you? And you shall live, and I will place you into your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. That is a God that is just, that is merciful, that goes to the ends of the earth to give all. To save a group of people that are about as undeserving as they could be. I mean, the Israelites, wow, that's a story. But it's, according to John, there's a whole category of the rest of the dead. So, you with me? You're thinking, okay, well, that's the Israelites. What about all the rest? Well, let's, there are a couple of scriptures. I'll give you one. There are more. And these are the direct words of Christ. Come with me to Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 11. Verse 20. Then he began to abrade the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, I mean, this goes back millennia, to Gentile nations... They would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes, but I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. More tolerable? But what I want to point out, there's, there are several scriptures. I mean, here's Sodom, Gomorrah, Tyre and Sidon. There's another scripture just over a page um, about Sodom. You know, you can't get much more decrepit than Sodom. There was a sexual perversion, but there was also the affluence aspect that we all often overlook. What is important about this scripture is the fact that they come up at the same time, in the same resurrection, and that's consistent with the rest of the dead not living again. Hebrews chapter 6. This speaks to us today. We've heard the name of Jesus Christ. Is there anybody here that doesn't know the name of Jesus Christ? 
And I think it's, you know, it, it's important. Th this, is, this was written to the Hebrews. I think this is important. We've all heard the name of Christ. It's just a question of what we do about it. Well, here's what, here's what Paul wrote to the Hebrews. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. Wow, those are, those are, <laughs> those are strong words. And you know why? The, the, the reason is given here. Since, this is the reason, since they would crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. God is merciful, but he's also just and he will not be mocked. That's the message for us in this room. Revelation chapter 20, we're going to conclude here. Verse 13 says, The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. These are people who knew. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, not life eternal. So even in justice, God is merciful. And then, of course, we have the beautiful passage in Revelation chapter 21. A new heaven and new earth, the old heaven has passed away. And I'll pick it up. In verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death. Remember, I said, I, I'm going to give you the good news at the beginning. <clears throat> death will be swallowed up in victory. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, and there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, I am it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. Remember what Jesus said on the last day of the feast, that great day? Everyone who thirsts will come to me and I will give him drink. It's like a cold, fresh glass of pure spring water. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. That's what the scripture says about a merciful and just God that is not willing that any should perish unless they choose to do so. That's the meaning and message of this day that we celebrate every year. I don't know of a better message. I don't know of more good news 
And I am confident that given the opportunity, I could win this case in court.